Memory Transcription Subject, Tarva, Exiting Governor of the Venlo Republic. Date, Standardized Human Time, March 17, 2137. Jonek straightened his ears, and pronounced the name of the next governor. Veln. My campaign had ended with the dramatic loss of my title, I'd given my concession speech in a daze, and issued thanks to the United Nations people for all the work we'd done together. With nothing left to lose over our secret, Ambassador Noah and I stood hand in paw at my desk, as I prepared to hand over the governor's duties to Veln. My most trusted advisers were also present, though Glim was a no-show after his barbed words yesterday. When I'd tried to broach the subject with my human astronaut, he deflected, saying he was concerned about how I was handling the loss. I believe that was a true statement, but Noah clearly was furious at Glim's opinionated outburst toward me. It was customary for some staff from previous administrations to be kept on, if they were viewed as competent in their duties, Chelm had been a holdover from the previous organization to me. Military advisors like Cam would have had a better shot at sticking around, had the Venlo general not been a strong proponent of the human alliance. It remained to be seen how Firebrand Veln would be as the man in charge, and how thoroughly he would cash in his campaign promises. The governor-elect strolled into his office, having given an acceptance speech I didn't bother to watch on the reception lawn. I can be gracious in defeat, even if I'm worried about what will happen to our alliance with the humans. Veln can't undo all the progress we've made, after we're in this deep. The people spoke, and they didn't have faith in my agenda, so I didn't deserve to win. Veln wrapped up his speech to arrive in my office with exact promptness, on the dot for when the highest seat in Skalga was officially his. Away from where the cameras were rolling, he was all business, there was a shrewdness in his eyes, though he made a point not to acknowledge Noah and I's intertwined grips. The new governor took the long way around the desk, to avoid passing us as a couple, and leaned back in the chair. He flicked his ears in satisfaction, and gestured to the recently cleared off desk as though imagining where his personal possessions would go. He then took inventory of the advisors that showed their faces, before finally speaking. You. You should consider yourself relieved of your position, the former colony governor spoke, indicating to Noah with his tail. I want a real diplomat from the United Nations here. Someone who can talk policies, negotiate our disagreements, and represent your government on a technical level. I know humans have people like that. Ambassador Williams offered a tight smile. I'll reach out to them. Someone from the embassy staff will be in contact within the day. Good. But don't go yet, because there's more to that message some of what I tell Cheln may apply to you. My diplomatic advisor will do much more legwork than under the previous administration, are you up for that, Cheln? Do you want to stay on? Cheln gave me an apologetic ear flick. Sir, I'd be happy to continue to serve the governor's office. Very good. Then I want several orders on my desk today, so start taking notes and preparing papers for my signature, press releases, and social media posts. Yes, I do understand the last one isn't your job, but I want a cohesive communication strategy. You're going to work with my online presence manager so we're on the same page. Understood, Governor Veln. Okay, my first order, businesses and municipalities have the right to require visors for binocular-eyed individuals. I couldn't hold in my gasp of outrage at the thought of humans being forced to conceal their eyes on our streets. It was better than Veln attempting to throw the Terran refugees off our worlds and revoke their citizenship, but this insulted a piece of their very existence, implying that they were offensive to look at. Such an infringement on the rights of human residents who were equal under the law, singling them out for eye placement, made my prosthetic tail stiffen with fury. How much damage could this do to our alliance with Earth? How would I feel, out on a date with Noah, if he was forced to wear a visor? I remember how the external pressure to hide the predatory aspects of his appearance caused him to devalue his own worth on Alpha. I won't let anyone hurt Noah, not even the rightful governor of Skalga. How dare you? I hissed, flailing my tail with outrage. 
Noah squeezed my wrist. It's all right, Tarva. Calm down, you don't have to stick up for us anymore. I want to. Your people, just as much as anyone else, and I won't stand for anyone treating you like monsters. Velm swished his tail in a patient gesture. I admire what you tried to do, Tarva. A member of your campaign staff told me about you and your human lover, I could have gone a lot further than vague insinuation on the debate stage, but I didn't. I don't hate humans, but I find that highly inappropriate. Tell me, do you think that's the sort of thing that should have been disclosed to the public? Fucking Glim. The rescue said he wanted Veln to win, he must have been upset when my rival didn't use the information to ruin me. No good deed goes unpunished. I don't see what my personal life has to do with denying millions of people the right to show their face. I spat, fury causing my pitch to climb. I'll explain for Noah to pass along to the United Nations in a moment. But what I'm saying, Tarva, is that the people don't want change. Not all at once. They want stability, and to feel in control of their destiny, Velm announced, as if it were self-evident. Shit. If I went as all out as my campaign promises, they'd resent me too by next election. What are you saying? I'm saying I won't uproot any lives, but I read the planet's temperature and I plan to take it down a notch. I'll give them enough of what they want to avoid civic unrest, and enough of what the humans want so that they can live with me. Public perception is what's important, and I plan to be a very popular governor, like I was on Milna. You think humans can live with a regression of their civic rights? You still haven't addressed what this order means for them. I have plenty of time, I was getting there. Rural villages were asking to have humans banned from setting foot in their towns, frankly, I'm not sure why they'd be suicidal enough to go there, but I digress. Businesses want to be allowed not to serve humans without fear of reprisal. So all in all, this is a lukewarm policy and I have valid reasons. Noah Williams, do you know how many Venlil have been hospitalized on this planet due to binocular eye-induced fainting, since the Battle of Earth? The astronaut shifted with discomfort. No. 12,931, though those could be outdated statistics, since it's from this morning. I won't tell you how many died from their fright, because it's not fair, but I'll tell you it's not zero. So yes, I think that if an elderly business owner feels they can't look at your eyes without fainting, they should have a right to require visors. Or maybe they don't want the liability if someone passes out on their premises. It doesn't hurt you, and when you send me an actual diplomat, I'll be happy to pencil in exceptions should you need to remove them for safety or to engage in an activity. As much as I wanted to argue against the proposition, Velm had a valid point over the public health concern. It lingered in the back of my mind that Noah felt responsible for stampede deaths from his arrival, so I knew he'd personally sacrifice his comfort to ensure the safety of Venlil citizens. When framed in that light, the astronaut likely was nodding along with the new governor's logic internally. Most businesses, at least in Dayside City, would be unlikely to employ such a policy, since it would cost them millions of potential customers. It also might help to lessen potential hostility toward Terrans in backwaters like Seljil Falls, where Glim's aunt was housed, despite prohibition of travel technically being illegal, several businesses and villages already tried to ban humans from their territory. Veln's intention seems to be to score points with his core constituencies, but at least he's thinking of humans, and doesn't seem hostile toward them. Venlil don't make decisions for humans, and vice versa. I suspect Terran refugees would be happy with that bargain, not having our values imposed on them. The new governor signaled free planet in tail language before launching into his next policy. All right, Chelm. I want some funds allocated toward exterminator upgrades, conveniently to upgrade equipment and add new departments to spread the workload. See what I did? I twisted my ears in confusion. You want them to separate their duties? Totally. They're worked too hard, and that's all I'm going to give you on my motives. Right, next item, predator disease facilities. 
we're launching the Violent Crime Prevention Program pronto. I'm targeting violent strains of the disease with the majority of our resources, which conveniently, should give you the majority of what you wanted. Human experts are welcome to draft some guidelines for warning signs. Because they know all about violence? Is that the implication? Ah, it's not my fault what people assume. I have no control over that, and I'm sure Venmal who jumped to that conclusion would believe that about humans regardless. Right, just a few more things, gotta have a productive day one. Next up, immigrants to Venlo Prime from other worlds will not be allowed to vote until six years have passed from the acceptance of their citizenship, to prevent foreign nationals from influencing our politics, mostly to keep Terran refugees from voting in the next provincial governor elections. Humans shouldn't be able to move to our planet and tell us what to do. Remember what I said about imposing values? I want people who vote to have stayed here and showed their commitment to us. If I didn't want any earthlings voting, I wouldn't have let those who've already gotten citizenship cast ballots in the next governor election. The humans will know who gave them a path to voting rights, and the Venlo people will know who stopped a sudden influx of predators from swaying our elections. Win-win. The more I listened to Veln detail his policies, it seemed that he was attempting to play both sides with compromise items. The governor seemed to agree with various revelations that humans gave us, if I could read between the lines, but he wanted to appease the constituents who weren't thrilled about our entire foundation of knowledge being ripped apart. By my own grudging admission, it was a clever strategy, for the sake of political gain, he was more worried about appearances than reality. I could understand I gave the perception that I went along with anything suggested by humanity. What I couldn't understand why he'd insisted on spelling out his plan changes with me, a deposed rival, in the room. Perhaps this is, as humans say, a wink and a nod to show Veln is on my side, for some issues, and that his rhetoric is aimed at winning over the masses? Or is this about gloating that he's a better governor? I heaved a flustered sigh. Congratulations on your victory, Veln, but as the unseated governor, now an ordinary citizen, I'm not sure why my presence is needed here. What I think of your policies doesn't matter. Oh, but it does, because I have something in mind for you, the Venlo replied, with a casual tail swish. It's about the sapient coalition. Now that we've made our planet's affairs independent from human influence, I have decided it's best to remain in the organization to keep an eye on them, write this down, Chelm. As I was saying, to keep an eye on them so we know what they're planning, and can enjoy the pure military benefits of the alliance. I'm glad to hear that you won't try to withdraw from the sapient coalition, but if that's all you wanted me to hear, you could have led with that. Tarva, that's your project. Before you were governor, you were our ambassador to the Federation. I want you to resume a role you were actually well suited for, to be our ambassador to the sapient coalition. It'll keep you in diplomatic contact with humanity, and honestly, I doubt there's anyone more comfortable or connected in the Earth Department. Plus, I'll be too busy with affairs here to handle that myself. I was silent for several seconds, shocked by the request. Uh, with respect, you just said that you didn't want us entangled with humanity. In that role, I imagine I'll be expected to follow your orders and wishes. You'll want me to sell them on policies I don't agree with, your policies. I know you know how to do that, Tarva. I'm sure it'll be difficult, after being governor, to take a step down, and to answer to the same person you lost to, no less. But I want to show that we're not enemies, like I said earlier, to lower the political temperature, and if we show how magnanimous I am along the way, wonderful. I thought you'd have some reservations, so I did think of a small incentive as a, signing bonus. What's that? Don't you dare lord something involving the human's welfare over my head. Nonsense, my offer was a benign topic. I wouldn't play with lives, I'm not the Federation. My incentive was about that referendum for the planet's name. In the interest of self-determination, it should be up to the people, though I do intend to speak my piece on why I'm not a fan of Skalga. You agree to be my ambassador, and I'll get the process in motion. 
I turned an inquisitive gaze on Noah, who'd been silent throughout the process. The human was attempting not to interfere with the newly elected governor, and he wasn't more vocal about what decision I should make. Without saying a word, the sideways glance of his binocular eyes told me that he thought I should follow what I wanted to do, I could rely on his affection and support, as long as I was happy. Beneath that, I could sense that the former ambassador wasn't fond of people like Velm. On a personal level, it was difficult for me to trust anyone who was so calculating with their appearances, but having a chance to ensure our continued friendship with Earth and its allies trumped that. Securing positive relations with the Predators had been my life's most meaningful work. My ears flattened with reluctance. Fine. I'll do it. Glad to hear it. Oh, and before you and Noah run along, if humankind has a particular objection to anything I proposed, I'm willing to negotiate. However, I'd need a concession in return that can score me equal political points, Veln said. Will that be a suitable arrangement, Mr. Williams? Noah dipped his head. We're accustomed to people like you. I'm sure we can work with that. Delightful. I look forward to more productive conversations with your replacement. You both may leave. Cam has classified briefings for the governor's ears only, I'm sure. I forced a polite farewell in tail language, not appreciating that parting shot, Velm couldn't resist sneaking in a reminder of his victory, perhaps in response to Noah's thinly veiled distaste toward him. As we departed the governor's office for the final time, I reminded myself that protecting humanity from persecution was more important than pride. The governor could have been more radical with his newfound power, and it was a small victory that I wouldn't be iced out of galactic politics. I couldn't say that the responsibility of an entire planet would be one I missed. If anything, my narrow defeat allowed Noah and I to spend our future together unrestricted. What came next for humanity and Venlokind was out of my paws now, but I hoped I'd done enough to lay the groundwork for a peaceful future between our two species. Memory Transcription Subject, Chief Hunter Isif, Arxer Rebellion Command Date, Standardized Human Time, March 17, 2137 Knowing how unbeloved my species was on Kalqua, there was no offer extended to the Duerton homogeneity to help with rebuilding and search and rescue, that had been a courtesy to humanity that I couldn't imagine my kind going along with for prey. The avians didn't attempt to drive us and the humans from the system, but they only sent a formal thank you to the yodel. I wasn't sure whether the Terrans felt slighted, though I sure did. The Duerton were fortunate that my request for temporary aid in restocking munitions, to tide us over until we could contact the United Nations, wasn't phrased as a demand. My lack of diplomatic aplomb meant it was best that I left the leaf-licking primates to deal with the fallout, especially after how the shield-allied races behaved seeing me at the summit. A cryptic communication from Jones pointed us to a repair outpost within a day's travel, repaying our expenditures without me asking. It was strange to have our fleet congregated so far away from the central sector, since the rebellion's early focus had been pestering agents within RIS territory. I was aware of the fact that we devoted an inordinate amount of attention to the Federation, after the surprising partnership between Giznal and Nikonis was revealed. Protecting Kalkwa thwarted the Kulshan's primary target, and now, the crux of the war hinged upon whether the Terran's single-minded push toward Afa could succeed. That was Zhao's third phase of the war, and rumor had it that stage two, cutting the conspiracy off from hundreds of allies, had been achieved through the Federation's staggering lack of cybersecurity. If humanity can get the Kulshan dynasty to surrender, then they'll be able to fight against the Dominion. Giznal knows that he is weaker than the Federation, by his own admission, which is why Betterment avoided their ire. I narrowed my eyes in the briefing room. The Dominion has not been trying to win a war, yes. I think they do not know how. They have not been active since Shaza's failure at Silas, which brought shame upon the chief hunter's repute. It may be possible to dismantle their operations enough that it is decided not to fight humanity at all. Do you really believe that Giznal would just surrender? I'm pretty sure he wishes to keep power at all costs, Lisa responded. I think if he believes there is no choice, and sees a way to bargain for some control, 
it may be possible. I am committed to a peaceful future for our people, and in this instance, I imagine your little SC buddies will not stand for betterment survival. With our rebellion left outside the organization, I am concerned with ensuring our continued existence as an independent entity. So the more we can reduce dominion control, the more bargaining power we have over the profit descendant if Afa falls. Kaisal heaved a weary sigh. Survival. I see why you have been focused on coexisting with prey. What we've done, returning cattle, trying to communicate, and saving the Duerton, might temper the calls for our race's genocide. Indeed. I do not think humanity would allow us to be attacked, given how they seek to end this forever war. However, I am concerned over how much free reign we will have and how we would move forward toward a better future through the galaxy's mistrust. And I want Riss under our control, not some other world with no history. Giznal must not take our home with him. Olek adjusted his glasses. So you're looking for ways to reduce Betterment's authority. What could leave Giznal more paranoid than stripping him of yet another chief hunter who's seen as loyal to the cause? We're in the neighborhood anyways. Ilthus? All our intelligence suggests he will stop at nothing to prove himself to Betterment. Young, hot-headed, a true believer. What on earth would convince him to jump ship? Lisa countered. Well, we did hand him the Malti in Dresden homeworlds on a silver platter. If he accepted a tip he knew came from us, then it can't be any more treasonous for him to accept a parley. I lashed my tail. That was a different circumstance, a raiding opportunity proves his fierceness to Giznal. Ilthus will not respond to talking. He responds to open strength and personal rewards, and the idea of a world without violence would disgust him. Then show him that the Dominion is weak, Chief Hunter. Kaisel's eyes glowed with new confidence, and his maw parted with eagerness. Show Ilthus the footage of the Dominion, and how they negotiate with the Colchians because they cannot best them. How they do not wish to win the war or hunt well. That's not a bad idea. Perhaps we can show humanity's strength to Ilthus. If humans have the power going forward, rewards from Giznal are empty. He's proving himself to the wrong team. True strength isn't staying within your role to avoid being crushed by Calamari, yes? Olek chuckled. I'm surprised you learned that word. I listen to the babbling of you humans when it serves me. If the Yodel are calling the Colchians a human food delicacy, I would be remiss not to adopt this term. The Calamari are responsible for the starvation of my people with the cure, regardless of whether Betterment released the cattle virus, so I have few moral quandaries about anything done to Afa. I hate those leaf lickers. I hope the Colchians are burned alive in their homes, for how miserable they have made my life. Kaisal growled. Convince Ilthus that true strength is joining the fight at Afa, for his personal glory across and beyond the Dominion. Well, the humans are en route to Afa as we speak. All they must do is get past the border stations and systems in between. So while I can support bringing Ilthus into the fold, we should craft a plan for how to establish contact with him at once, if you want him to arrive in time. I drummed my claws on the table in deep thought, Ilthus' location was a given, with him likely trying to bloody the Dresden and Malti's nose. Unlike Kalsum's fleet, the duo had retreated some of its ships even without the stark warning that Crocodile Captain had been given. It was my sincere hope that, among the young chief hunter's attempts to grab easy cattle, especially with the egg-laying Malti offering scrumptious delicacies in the form of their unhatched young, I hoped that he had the foresight to take out their shipyards and bases. Coupled with the human cyber attack, that should ensure those loyalists didn't ever come kicking around again. Even if Afa was defeated, the true cultists of the Federation, like the Dresden and the Predator sacrificing Yulpa, would be unlikely to drop out of the fight. All right, Kaisal, I imagine your plan is for us to head to Dresden and Malti space and offer assistance? I do not particularly wish to preside over raids myself, especially with the harm that would do to our image. This rebellion is about proving that the Arxer are capable of being more than brutal, 
senseless beasts, I growled. The runt flared his nostrils. I merely wish for you to travel close enough to pinpoint Ilthus' command ship. It won't be engaged at the center of the battle, though someone as cruelty proficient as this chief hunter will be trying to get some kills himself. You can extend a hail from there. If I may, why don't we contact UN Intelligence and see if they've tapped the Arxer comms enough to connect us via FTL channels. There's no need to put ourselves in the line of fire, Lisa said. Very well, I acknowledged. Zhao is the ideal figure to bargain with, though. Jones is your go-to contact for intelligence. With respect, sir, I'll attempt to go through her, as long as I have your blessing, I can keep her from pushing anything. Fine, but if that plotting human tries to pull some shenanigans, I want us dialing Zhao and only Zhao. Of course. Don't worry, I'll make sure this is quick and to the point. I watched in silence, along with the rest of my advisors, as the primate dialed General Jones. The American intelligence guru had a knowing gleam in her eyes, something which never sat right with me, it was as if she knew what we wanted to ask before any words were said. Terrans could certainly have prying eyes and ears in unexpected places, using technological infrastructure as a weapon. I didn't quite believe her claim that her agencies weren't spying on my people. My guess was that the humans listened in even on Tarva's governorship activities, despite the close alliance. It was fortunate for Earth that they had such a devoted friend in Skalga's highest office. Let's see if Jones gets any ideas about how to use me to her advantage. If Lisa can't get the spymaster to help the rebellion out of decency, then I'll never work with her again. I'm not being pushed into doing things outside of my agenda by manipulative means. General Jones raised her hands placatingly. Isif, no need to look so skeptical. All we wanted was to split the Dominion and tilt the scales of this war. It was in my national and planetary interests to spur you to action at a few key places, but now, there's no need for subterfuge. I can see you doubt my intentions, but know I'm happy to advance your rebellion's aims. Lisa, I believe you said you would handle the chatter. I do not feel like chatting, you know how arcs are tired of socializing. Lisa snorted. Yes, I've heard most arcs are due. Uh, ma'am, we were hoping you could patch us through to Chief Hunter Ilthus. Speaking to him could provide a key opportunity to siphon away Giznal's allies, or that's the plan. Yes, I definitely support attempts to weaken them without direct engagements. Let me consult my database, ah, uh, what a coincidence, the general exclaimed, wagging a finger. I happened to be looking at Ilthus' file when you called. I'll transmit his coordinates, and with this access code, you should be able to communicate with his ship. I stifled a sigh as Jones made a few swipes with her fingers. Olek gave me a nod to signify that he received the data, and Lisa disconnected the call after a formal thanks. I was pleased that we'd been able to attain the information with minimal back and forth, and that it wasn't a conditional offering. My eyes narrowed, before I gestured for the two humans and scrawny Kaisal to exit the picture. We couldn't afford to have any sapients nearby that Ilthus would see as a sign of weakness. The mask of cruelty that I'd perfected for my facade around betterment returned, an unwelcome reminder of my own bloody past. I bared my teeth to signify ferocity, and signaled for Olek to initiate the call to the fiery chief hunter. Ilthus responded, after a long stretch of our entreaty going unanswered, as a proper holographic avatar, the chief hunter had taken the time to send the full image of his toned form onto my projector, rather than the basic 2D visual. I suppressed a huff, realizing that I should have done the same. That was how the highest-ranking Dominion officers communicated, so out of the gate, my status seemed inferior to him. The hot-headed Arxer had scars sliced across his muzzle that seemed artificially inflicted, perhaps to signify his toughness. His gray skin had a bit of a green pallor to it, and his features were locked in a permanent scowl. This commander had the swagger of someone who'd fought a thousand battles. It's apparent he's trying to compensate for his lack of experience through intimidation. 
Does Ilthus know what it is to command enough to hold up to the Colchians? Well, if it is not the traitor to the dominance of our people. The filth that bargains with prey, consorting with our enemies, Ilthus sneered. What is it that you want? I raised my maw in defiance. For starters, I would like some gratitude for the easy hunt I gave you. I know many things about the state of the galaxy. I also know how to position Arxer for survival and strength. You forget the first item, is that not so? I would not pass up prey and a chance to showcase my hunting ability. My raids are much crueler than yours, the best you could do was gassing Venlo schools and a few movie reels. Your raid, I'm sure, is quite impressive. That is why I wish to speak with you about more opportunities to demonstrate your talent, and make a name for yourself as you seize power with the utmost prowess. Once you hear my reasons for joining our hunt, and what I can offer you, you will have no doubts about which side is weak and which side is beneficial to your agenda. I have no reason to listen to your prattling, and I tire of this conversation. Words mean very little, when I do not have any reason to believe you are anything but past your prime and defectively weak. This groveling to the feats of my raid acknowledges my superior cruelty with no resistance. You must prove that you are a better chief hunter than me, if I am to listen to this at all. The softened up worlds you placed in my jaws are the sole reason I took your call, in the interest of more feasts you may know about. A contest of strength is one I can handle. I have seen many battles and am certain that I can outmaneuver the likes of you. One thousand of your ships versus one thousand of mine. No tricks or subterfuge, no reinforcements for a coward's win, just a direct confrontation in space. If you best my people, Giznal will be delighted that you defeated the pesky rebels, and lured us into the open. Ilthus snorted with a dismissive tone. I'll gain no satisfaction by crushing your ragtag force. It is you, the very head of power, that I doubt. I have a separate proposal, an honorable one. You come to my base, without any army or backup, and we engage in ritual sword fighting, Tliskis. Unless you've forsaken your weapon ornaments. Why would I be foolish enough to come alone, to your territory, for a Tliski's duel? I want to show my worth by defeating the supposedly great Isif. Sending your memory to the prey pastures where it belongs. I am no coward that would back down from a fight, especially an easy one against a weak defective. Fine. I trust that you are not so petrified of your betters that you would seek a cheap victory. I noticed that the humans looked horrified at my swift agreement, as if they believed it was folly. Whatever the leaf lickers thought, I had pride left over, and I could tell Ilthus had too much arrogant confidence to backtrack on his challenge. I will see you humiliated at my blade, and we will speak about why you should join me afterward. Empty words, like all of this talking you adore. When I win, I will execute you. Giznal will know who has slain the traitor from our ranks, and that it was through my superiority. Ilthus hissed. The chief hunter pounded away at his console, forwarding the coordinates to his base, given that I wished to recruit him to our side, I was not going to take the opportunity to strike the clandestine facility. There were more important enemies than one overly proud Arxer. The less Dominion ships I needed to slaughter to complete my rebellion's aims, the better. Ilthus disconnected from the call after a threatening roar, as disdain swirled in his eye slits. I surveyed my advisor's expressions, and noticed that Kaisal seemed a bit jealous. The Arxer runt must envy how respectable and powerful a soldier slightly older than him had become through the merits of his strength. If Ilthus thinks I've lost a step, he'll be in for a rude awakening, I can be calculating and patient. Too much eagerness to prove himself will mean his judgment is clouded by his anger, that doesn't mean I can't physically prepare myself. Without any discussion with my advisors, as the matter was settled, I stood from the table. This was not up for debate, since we needed to strike at the Dominion's very foundation. It was time for me to prepare for the confrontation with Ilthus. I intended to sharpen my sword and retrain myself in the art of Tliskis. 
achieving maximum readiness for our duel would ensure that the probability of victory was turned in my favor as much as possible. Memory Transcription Subject, Chief Hunter Isif, Arxer Rebellion Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, March 18, 2137. The humans, and their higher-ups, believe that Mytliski's duel with Ilthus was a poor idea. There was a history on risk of high-class society settling feuds through this strength display, though there was no obligation to accept such a challenge, I knew I couldn't afford to be seen as weak by my rebels. Doubt had been sown by my friendliness with the humans, and my personal secrecy to hide Felra's presence in the past. Tliskis was nothing so disorderly and random as a single turn and draw of a gun, as I'd read about on Earth. It was practiced as both a sport for training sessions, and an unequivocal contest of who the better fighter was. It might be the most social aspect left in our society, even if it was just locking swords. I checked that my ceremonial armor was snug, while adjusting the padding underneath it. The extravagant sword and exquisite gear were fine pieces of craftsmanship, gifts betterment bestowed upon its worthy hunters as symbols of rank, I wore these for important communications and ceremonies, such as when the Prophet Descendant issued commendations for terror-inducing raids. It brought back memories of when I executed the Arxer who refused to eat a gojid, knowing I had to play the fanatic. Slipping into that cruel, familiar persona would be easier than I'd like to admit. After years of practice putting down any comrade who challenged or insulted me, there was no reason I couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ilthus. My claws hooked around the ornament case, there were three fragile squares the size of a Terran Rubik's Cube, which were crafted from a red crystal called Queshua native to Riss. The intricate patterns that showed up under the UV lights of Atliski's match made it near impossible to pull off any fakes, not that I would stoop to such means to win our battle. The crystalline squares had to be attached between our chest and our waist, facing the opponent, and not on any limbs. The winner of the duel was whoever could break all of their rival's ornaments first, each time a crystal broke. The round concluded so the loser could reset their adornment. It was a simple, yet brutal, contest. While attacks toward the head and the neck were prohibited, any other area was fair game for stab wounds. I can withstand the pain of a few cuts. The question is if my greater experience can counter Ilthus' faster speed, success will be achieved by outwitting his strategy. As I approached the fated site alone, there were no treasonous moves from the young chief hunter. His morality was self-serving and dubious, but he respected strength and courage, he wanted to best me beyond any doubts, so that meant no tricks were forthcoming. It would be strategically prudent to take me out of the picture and forsake pride, yet his hot-headedness prevented him from suppressing his arrogance here. At this age, in his prime, Ilthus likely thought he was invincible. His aggression, attempting to humiliate me out of the gate, was almost a certainty. I also believed that if I won, he would humor a persuasion attempt to join our side, per his word. Kaisal hailed my transport, as it docked with Ilthus' designated habitat. Ancestors speed your victory, chief hunter. May his blood wet your sword. Thank you, I responded, steadying my nerves. I have a purpose to fight for, beyond myself, the purpose of our entire people. A future that is worth great sacrifices. Besides, there are some selfish gains, I will have your eavesdropping human friends know that I am no softy. Swinging a sword won't prove that, Olek chirped. It will when I swing the sword at your neck, and lop your skull clean off. That would put an end to your conspiracy theories, yes? Actually, no. In the event of my death, I've set up a cache of evidence for various government plots to be uploaded, so that nobody can silence my findings. For instance, I don't trust them doing cure research, they're undoing the cure, but what else are they doing? There's no oversight, and the planetary security excuse is horseshit. What are they doing, Alec? Cloning people for bullet fodder? Putting a kill switch in the DNA of anyone who likes conspiracies? There'll come a day where they're able to know everything about you, even your deepest thoughts, just by observing a few elements of your biology, and it'll be a lot sooner than you think. Laugh all you want, Lisa, 
but we're welcoming the death of privacy with open arms. I heaved a flustered sigh. Enough. You are distracting me before an important contest with your incessant chatter. If you ever talk like this on the bridge, I'll feed you to Ilthus in pieces myself. Ah, yes, cannibalism is such a funny joke with your hiss. I disconnected from the channel, hissing with exasperation. At least those two humans being their infuriating selves brought me a notch closer to combat mode, sometimes, I yearned to take a metal blade to their ornaments. My facial features hardened into a menacing mask, devoid of emotion, and I disembarked to face off with Ilthus in person. The chief hunter was waiting with the smugness of someone who believed they'd already won, my paw drifted to the hilt of my sword, though it stayed in my scabbard. I wasn't going to take a premature swipe at him, but the gesture of animosity would get through. I don't miss having to communicate in cruelty, unable to hint at any emotions. That said, I was pretty good at pretending, isn't that right? Ilthus smacked his tail on the ground energetically. HSS, this fool believes he is the finer chief hunter. I'm sure he was great in the old days, but he strayed from the path. I'm surprised he remembers how to hold a sword. What a lovely greeting. I say we go straight to the Tliskis, since this conversation is a waste, yes? Works for me. But I'll have you know that my raid against the Dresden was sublime, we landed raiding parties, and set off demolition charges in their caves. Burying villages like that, ha! Huh? That's a new one, my idea. How masterfully cruel. I imagine you would not have come back if you managed to keep the planets. You did not even mention the Malti. I'm not idiotic enough to waste resources. Those mindless animals are fighting among themselves, so I hardly need to bomb them. I'm surprised the cowardly prey don't stampede the second one of their own throws a claw swipe. The humans can be attributed to this unrest. They put your raid to shame, they dismantled the foundation of over two hundred worlds. As if I'd believe that. There were none of those Venlo-loving apes in sight. That is why they are so terrifying, Ilthus. You do not see a lethal virus in action, it kills in its silence. The Terrans I know of refuse to kill anyone. That was the whole premise of the fight at Silas and Fal, warring so those who helped bomb them would live. The enemies of Earth that fell were by your maneuvering. A point of contention between us. They choose to minimize bloodshed, but I have no doubt that humanity could lay waste to the galaxy if they didn't. The Federation should be afraid of what they tried to awaken. Their cleverness. Isif, no sales pitch from you means a morsel until you have any strength to flaunt. I suggest you think of your last words for when you're executed for your defeat. I do not need to waste time preparing for things that will not happen. Ilthus growled at me, eyes narrowed to crazed slits. The two of us had reached the Tliskis arena. On opposite sides, I could see starting pads scattered a few seconds of running apart, the pedestals in the center offered places to climb or use the environment to our advantage. As the rival chief hunter strapped his first ornament over his armored stomach, I considered the placement of my own object. If the ornament broke, even as a result of my actions, it would count for Ilthus as long as it didn't happen after a tally of mine. Staying up on my feet, and avoiding dropping my weight onto the fragile item, would be crucial. With a grunt of determination, I tightened the band around my sternum, and fixed my ornament right in the center. In range of both arms to defend, so it's safer from any sidelong stabs toward the hip. If I fall, I can catch myself on all fours to avoid breaking it. Everything aside from head and neck shots, an attack such as biting or headbutting were fair game, so I needed to watch for any ambitious tail swipes from Ilthus. I also should throw in the occasional kick or slash of my own, to keep him on his toes. It might serve me to knock over his platform, rather than contest the elevation, if the young Arxer went for the high ground. I drew my sword with confidence, ready for a frenetic clash of wits and body. Tliskis was an exhilarating format, though I wasn't sure whether my reflexes were quite as sharp as they used to be. 
Still, my experience was nothing to laugh at, and I was certain I could outthink any Dominion lackey. A cautious approach would take the wind out of his sails, along with granting me insight into his strategy. I stepped onto the starting pad, and lowered myself to a lunging stance, with my body facing toward the ground, the ornament would be angled away from Ilthus. The other chief hunter was going to meet only my sword, and if my head was facing him, he couldn't swing at it without being disqualified. If my head was intentionally maneuvered in the path of a blow, that was the sole way it could be ruled a fair shot. I lashed my tail to signal readiness, and Ilthus did the same. The young chief hunter had no sooner smacked his pad with force before he raced toward the pedestals, cresting one as tall as an arxer without using the lower platforms as stepping stools. He stared me down from the powerful vantage point, realizing I was staying put. Coward? What, you frozen like prey? Going to wet yourself and faint? Ilthus jeered. The chief hunter lunged with staggering power from his hind legs, leading sword first. With the pointed tip blazing toward me, I was doubtful I could parry his blistering momentum. There was no time to sidestep, before Ilthus landed nearly atop me, careful to keep his maw turned away from me, his sword finished its trajectory. The young arxer wasn't aiming for the ornament I guarded, instead driving his blade into my thigh. I staggered from the pain, shoving him away with the pommel. My rival landed with grace on all fours, absorbing the momentum through his paws and keeping the crystal strapped to his stomach safe. He took crazed swings toward my Queshua token, and though I saw his tail coming, I could barely fend off the sword by itself. My hind legs were swept out from under me with a brutal lash, and it was all I could do to keep my blade from clattering to the floor. Iltha scrambled toward me, wrapping his tail around my weapon, he wrenched it from my dazed grip, ignoring how the sharp edges lacerated his skin. A gloating glint shone in his eyes, as he shattered my crystal into tiny fragments with an unnecessarily forceful swing. I could feel the impact through my armor, and struggled to shake it off. After collecting my weapon, I disguised my limp on my walk to the ornament collection. Failure to reset quickly was considered forfeiture. I donned my new cube, and hustled back to the pad. With how impressive my opponent's aggression was, I could see why he climbed the ranks at a young age. I lashed my tail. Is that the best you can muster? Iltha signaled his readiness, and this time, I opted not to wait for him to come to me. I sprinted toward the pedestal at the same time as him, weaving around the column while keeping low to the ground. The chief hunter had climbed the platform again, but was unable to get a clean stab at me. He twirled in my direction, just as I wildly swatted with my sword toward his belly. My rival's blade moved in a blur, an instinctual response, his reaction was near instantaneous, deflecting my brazen attempt. I scrambled backward as he rolled to the ground, and tracked his movements and cues. His legs tensed before he dashed toward me. Forget the ornament, I need to cripple him, and limit his speed. I fainted a swing at his crystal, before thrusting my blade into his knee and twisting. Ilthus howled, but had the presence of mind to hold my blade in his wound. I couldn't pull it away without giving him clean access to my crystal, so I released my grip. Crimson blood gushed from his deep gash as he ripped the weapon out. The chief hunter favored his leg so much that he barely put weight on it. The young arxer crossed my blade with his own, flaunting his dual wielding, I couldn't conjure any unarmed strategies. It might be best to break my crystal on purpose, get my sword back for the next round, and avoid further injuries, but that would leave me with one crystal. Was I that confident? My leg was injured from its own stab wound, though it was less destabilizing. I was without a weapon, left to defend myself with my arms and a nimbleness that was long gone. The possibility of my total defeat crossed my mind, but I recognized that this was the best strategic option, even if my pride spurred me to keep pressing. The humans had taught me anything could be a weapon, everything but the kitchen sink. I ripped the ornament from my chest, and hurtled it at Ilthus, if I was going to destroy it, I might as well rain glass shards on his other leg. Arxer might not have Terran's arm torsion, 
but chucking an object at the ground was within my capabilities. The chief hunter snarled at my opportunistic forfeiture, losing his footing when pain shot up his good leg. He stayed down for several seconds, still not standing after I donned my last crystal. My sword, I demanded, snatching it from his grip. You cannot fight on, Ilthus. The chief hunter used his own blade to prop himself up, and leaned on it to stagger back to his pad. He lashed his tail in defiance, raising his sword into a defensive posture. I signaled my readiness, while collecting my wits, this was now a must-win duel, but Ilthus looked hobbled after the previous round. As the new sequence commenced, it was my enemy remaining stationary in his starting spot, grimacing as he stood. The arxer was flexing the leg that the ornament shattered against, but the other limb had lost its functionality altogether after the surgical cut. He brandished his sword with frustration, snarling. I took my time stalking forward, and kept just out of range, moving from side to side so he was forced to turn awkwardly, the longer this went on, the more Ilthus would be testing his exhausted pain tolerance. I faked a lunge forward, laughing as he made a frantic sword move to block. I moved just within range and swiped toward the ornament, connecting with his metal weapon on purpose. While my rival struggled to bat away my blade, my tail snapped his better leg out from under him, all of his weight was thrown onto the wounded limb, causing him to shriek in anguish. His focus waned as he fell, and I snaked my sword around his to break a crystal. The chief hunter took several attempts to get up, and stewed as he realized he needed to walk to retrieve a new item. The only prize of a loss is to talk about something that will benefit you, I said. Forfeiture would spare you the pain, you can go get treatment. Ilthus almost hopped one-legged over to his box. I should have watched for the limb cut a round ago, but an arxer fights on. All I need is to break one more ornament of yours, you're still slow, old, and weak to be empathizing with my pain. This is not empathy as much as an admission of your pathetic state, unworthy of a duel with me. Hurry up, or you will be disqualified. The chief hunter secured his jaw around his sword to muffle whimpers, and tried to run over to his pad. He crashed onto the starting spot in the nick of time, thumping his tail as he was still on all fours. To my surprise, Iltha stayed down this time, deciding he was better off low to the ground. It was a valid play, Given that I couldn't swing at his head from my high angle, however, it surrendered all mobility and exposed many vulnerable spots. My rival hugged his knees to his chest with his tail and arms, shielding the ornament with his flesh. I inched forward, considering my strike with caution. Before I could jab at the sensitive wounded area, Iltha sprang to his feet, despite the pain, and swept his sword in a wide arc. I barely leapt back in time leaning my upper body backward to protect the ornament. His sharp instrument clanged against the armor of my stomach, and sucked the breath from my lungs from the force. I parried a second attempt to swing upward, and stumbled backward in a hurry, knowing he couldn't follow my retreat. Ilthus' eyes looked crazed and his nostrils flared, before he sank back to all fours, stripped of his willpower. Certain that he couldn't lunge from this awkward fall, I rushed forward and swung at his wounded leg. The chief hunter overcommit to defending that painful area, allowing me to twist the point towards the true target. My sword glided up just enough to glance his crystal, shattering it. Ilthus grunted. Fuck you. I only need one hit. Are you delusional? You cannot fight me in this state, and it will only damage your reputation to crawl around like this, I spat. No. I fight, to the last. The chief hunter hurried over to the box, as best as he could with a maimed limb, and thrashed his tail once he was hunched back over on the pad. I was growing tired, but that just prompted me to end this bout with swiftness, all I needed was to break the final ornament, and I could achieve my goal of persuading him to abandon betterment. Our cause could use the extra forces a chief hunter would bring to the table, and if he agreed to raid Offa after hearing about Giznal's arrangement with the Colchians, that might help the Terrans to focus on the Dominion after this clash. I marched back to my pad, thrumming my tail to start the deciding round. Ilthus stumbled forward with aggravated hisses. 
Stealing a page from his book, I waited for him to draw close enough, before using a small pedestal to boost myself up to the highest one. My rival paused, expecting me to lunge at him. However, not willing to risk my crystal shattering in the chaos, I leapt short of where Ilthus waited. It was then that I kicked in my last burst of speed, jabbing my sword at his gut with all of my strength and willpower. The enemy didn't bother to defend, instead taking it as an opportunity to go for my crystal. I drove my blade through the fragile Queshua, and heard my own shatter a half-second later. The young chief hunter recognized that I'd landed the break first, rather than contesting who won, and conceded the match with a grudging huff. He seemed relieved to be able to sit down and mend his wounds. Fine, fine. Spill out why the fuck you think I should side with a defective like you, but I doubt I'll be persuaded. I'll honor my word and let you leave after this is through, Ilthus growled. I pulled my holopad from atop my waiting belongings. I'm going to show you a single video of Giznal talking to the late Nikonis, yes, then the leader of the Federation. If you can't parse that the Dominion is afraid of the Colchians, and that they don't want us to win, unlike humanity and me, nothing I say will matter. You do have much energy in fight, and I respect those qualities. Betterment isn't worthy of your strength, not when they are the ones in league with all of our leaf-licking foes. That's preposterous. Betterment would never bargain with prey like you do. Good thing I have evidence to prove this very statement. Hear it with your own keen ears, yes? The young chief hunter took my holopad with reluctance. I watched his facial expression grow enraged, as he listened to Giznal appeasing the Colchians, and promising not to push too far in the war as to actually win it. It was the humans who Nikonis blasted as a major setback, and my rebellion which the prophet descendant hated for thinking we could rule all by ourselves. I was ready to jump in with evidence of our triumphs and innovations, how our side pushed the boundaries of warfare, when this video was over. Something told me that there was a good chance of getting Ilthus to send his troops to Alpha, this was the fight betterment shied away from, and weakness was an admission he abhorred. My success in the duel could give both humanity and the rebellion an advantage in our respective fights.